Ahojte, moji milí druháci. Vítam vás na ďalš- ďalšej hodine, ktorú máme. A mimo ja, keď sa nos dovolí, tak poslednej hodine o staroveku. A, a hada sa nám podarí za hodinku dokončiť Rímanov, či dnes, dnes pôjdeme na rímske císárstvo. Takže... Ja mám ešte nedeľu, február, ale vy už máte marec, no a nezabudnite rovnako reagovať na otázky, ktoré máte, ktoré som zavecil ešte pred hodinou. Myslím, že ste jednoznačne reagovali bez výnimky asi na to, že tieto hodiny vám vyhovujú, takže som rád, že vám pomáhajú. Ako ste si mnohí všimli, tak táto prezentácia nie je, na, uh, nie je v poznámkach, máte to len ako taký pracovný hárok, pracovný zošit a asi preto na tejto hodine ste celkom aj závislí. Každopádne viete sami, že musíte dosť veľa vecí si vyhľadať ešte sami. No a samozrejme potom ďalšie zadanie stredovek bude zase o čosi inom, bude zase trošku iné, no ale to bude, to bude samozrejme na niečo ďalšie. Nezabudnite, že termíny na odovzdanie vašich zadaní sú teda je cez víkend 7. v nedelu o 8. večer, dovtedy mi na môj e-mail, prosím vás, nie na EduPage ani nikde inde na Facebook, mi posielate vaše práce, môžete tak už od piatku, dajme tomu, ak mi posielate skôr už dnes, v nedelu 28. niektorí začali posielať, o týždeň ste sa sekli decka a môžete sa stratiť medzi maturitnými alebo sočkarskými prácami, pretože v stredu máme školskú prehliadku prác soč. Stredoškolskú odbornú činnosť. Dobre, poďme teda, poďme teda začať, dúfam, že teda neprešvihnem ako minule, no a my sme minule skončili teda smrťka Julia Cezara a debatovali sme o tom, že kedy vlastne koniec tej republiky a kedy začiatok císarstva, ale od Teraz od Octavian Augusta budeme môcť hovoriť o císarstve. Dobre. OK, so let's start, guys. Um, when uh, Gaius Julius Caesar was killed, um, he let uh, no kids, uh, I mean the official heirs to his uh, heritage, to his, uh, to his possessions and property, uh, because he had no son. So that's why he... Uh, adopted in his testament in this last will his uh, I think like second nephew or something like that and that was uh, one of the members of so-called the second triumvirate and that was this guy uh, Octavius Octavianus or uh, Octa- guys Octavius Augustus Augustus actually nickname it means like noble honorable vznešený uh, Octavius like eight guys you know eight number octum and guys is his name but as you can see uh, his uh, Surname is Caesar too, and that's the reason because Caesar uh, posthumously adopted him as a uh, as his son, and uh, he also like ordered le- legions to obey him. And this very young, this very young uh, uh, consul and uh, tribune later on uh, actually inherited uh, not the possessions maybe, but actually he inherited the political message of uh, Gaius Julius Caesar and just like he he also organized other um, legi- legionary uh, commanders of uh, former Caesar's legions just Marcus Antonius and also Lepidus and they organized again in the second triumvirate uh, these guys uh, agree just like in the first triumvirate to coordinate the actions to divide uh, rising empire of Rome of the Roman Republic and cooperate. Uh, its first thing was to uh, punish all the killers, all the assassins from the God Julius Caesar's death, uh, which was done in a couple of months and weeks. Uh, but as before the same thing happened, then civil war uh, was restored and uh, uh, they start to fight each other. Lepidus, again, just like Crassus, uh, was the first one to be out of the of the game. And uh, Octavianus uh, and Marcus Antonius, Mo- or Mark Antony, start to fight each other. In this case, uh, in this case, what happened was that ah, you cannot see it again, as always, because of my face. Uh, as always, uh, Marcus Antonius, uh, uh, just like Pompeius, that was really similar, he actually escaped to Egypt and he again met with Cleopatra, again, for the third time we have been here. But this was a bit different because in many stories uh, they were depicted like Cleopatra really loved him uh, and if not, maybe she was kind of... Uh, in a trap there. So the re- finally the thing was that when Octavius' uh, navy was uh, coming closer, sailing closer to Egypt, so they sent uh, their navy, like Hellenistic Egyptian Roman navy, to fight them, and that was big battle of Actium. 
uh, in which uh, navy of Octavius win uh, won. Sorry for that. And uh, they embanked in Egypt, and that's why they ran away. Actually, Mark Antony uh, committed suicide, and Cleopatra later on too. And there are many, there were many stories that uh, she, they, they're in love, and they uh, let the, get the poison of cobra the snake or whatever. So there are various stories. I'm not sure really which one is uh, the exact ones, uh, the exact one. The point is that uh, Octavius he <laughs> he came back to Rome. Uh, and he went on with the conquest, and now without any other guys around from the triumvirate, and again, Senate was a bit scared uh, of all the punishments, um, of course, against the assassins, but at the same time, they were happy. Actually, war was over. There were no other rivals to challenge his power, and so on. So gradually, Senate started to donate uh, Octavius Augustus with almost the same titles and political functions, uh, just like Caesar, his uh, like stepfather, uh, used to have. And that's why he had actually all the functions, like tribune of the people, consul, only one consul. He was proclaimed dictator and lifetime dictator. He was proclaimed also Pontifex Maximus, so the main priest, and all the stuff. And we have actually, again, the same situation as with Caesar. The point was that it was a bit different, and also empire... Uh, of the Republic was not only the Republic, Republic, it was the empire of this guy, of this of this young man. And that's why they start to call, uh, actually, these territories of the Roman Republic and all the provinces, Imperium, which is, well, as we call it, Risha, so a huge country that is usually outside of any ethnic, cultural, and even geographical borders. So this was something that you have Roman power even beyond the Pyrenees, the Alps, and uh, Latin influence with Greek influence, even like Oriental despotes, and suddenly we have Romans there. At that time, Romans were already fighting against Parthians, which is Persia. So that's why he started to be called also with a brand new title, and it's Imperator. And that's why usually uh, the beginning of, of the empire is set since this proclamation, 27 uh, B, uh, C. The thing is that he ruled for many years, and uh, their invasions to other provinces made new countries actually integral part of this imperium, of this empire. Among these that uh, definitely you have to remember are, of course, Egypt, uh, Rhaetia, which is Switzerland nowadays, Dalmatia, Dalmatia, which is uh, Croatia today, Noricum, Austria today, Pannonia, West Hungary today, Africa, which is Tunisia, of course, Judea, Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Syria. So you see that many of these lands and provinces, and as I promised to you that, not to you, actually, I promised to graduates that they will be given blind map, blank map of uh, Roman Empire, Roman provinces, just like your assignment is to write. I don't know how many uh, I gave, but you'll see that it's not such a big deal. And uh, there are many of them. The thing is that Octavius was ruling like uh, the guy that the Republic was still there, despite it, when he was uh, to die, he prepared. He was preparing his daughter to marry some guy who could actually inherit it, and he could pass over all his political functions and power. So it was not a republic you are going to elect. You just want to hand over the power to somebody else. So that was also the sign it was looked like more, more like monarchy and not like a republic or democracy. In this way, he finally managed, after big complications, to pass succession of the Trojan Asladinso to his son-in-law, Tiberius, who was another an next second emperor than Titus and many, many others. That's why we talk about so-called Julio-Claudian dynasty, because Claudius Claudius, one of the others, he was from the other family, and they matched together. And it was actually just like a royal house, like a royal dynasty. But that was not kind of like heritage of, uh, or of heirs to the throne like in Middle Ages, where we'll analyze it later. The thing is that during uh, all these Julia claudian emperors, including or starting with Octavius and Tiberius and ending up with uh, Diocletianus, uh, still, these republican institutions existed. So there was Senate, there was Concilium Plebuis. The point was that senators actually voted according to the wish of the emperor. If not, they could get lost or they were just banished from the Senate and so on. And Concilium Plebuis usually loved these guys because they were winning, they were giving them new lands, and thus plebeians, poor people, could serve in legions and find their own destiny. They could settle in Gallia and Hispania and Dalmatia, Pannonia. So for them, it was actually a good system, you know. So all the time, tribunes 
and uh, I mean, I mean, tribunes were never elected different guys than uh, than the emperors. And even Octavius, he proclaimed himself that. Uh, you know, Republic exists, despite I am Imperator. Actually, even he proclaimed that the guys Julius Caesar and Senate uh, proclaim it that he's actually divine. He's almost like God-like. And the same was that uh, talking about Augustus, that it, his uh, nickname Augustus is like great, beautiful, almost like God, like ancient God. And also on the statues is depicted like Apollon from uh, classical Greek statues. If you remember, this is the same gesture with pointing finger, looking somewhere else, you know, that that's the point, That's this is the thing. Still he claimed, you know, okay guys, you know, I don't want to be like the despot, so he let them be. Uh, and for that reason he said, you know, I'm. we are all equal, but I am princeps. Princeps, it actually it's a funny thing, because uh, princeps, it is the, the third uh, form of adjectives, like the best, the most, uh, the most beautiful, and prince, it means the first. So, the most first. <laughs> so, when you proclaim people, like, we are all equal, but I am the first or the firstest. You know, the most first. So, it's like a tricky thing, but it's hiding your power that we are equal, that I am more equal than the others. It sounds funny, but in many uh, empires, imperialistic policies, and for many, many other guys later on, this empire would be just example how to rule. Usually, these guys were dictators from... Uh, uh, I don't know, German emperors to uh, to absolutistic monarchs of France or Austria, uh, to Napoleon Bonaparte in France, and even ended up with uh, Benito Mussolini in fascist Italy or Adolf Hitler in Nazi Germany. That's why we talk about this first period of empire about principate, because then in the 3rd century AD, things would be changed and Senate would be abolished, and there would be only one master, one lord, in Latin called Dominus. Dominus means the Lord and no other assembly, no people voting, electing with their political rights, somehow limiting their power. And this would be big inspiration for them. Okay, uh, of course, I added some um, videos or maybe some nice uh, useful links and uh, I was uh, looking for, okay, come on, we don't have uh, ads because I uploaded this. Okay, so you can watch uh, interesting things because Rome is really uh, famous and really popular topic within the history and for info amateurs and uh, like common people. And I really love these 3D reconstructions because still you can visit Rome and you can see many of uh, uh, sites or former sites. And it, actually, in our class, there is a big poster from National Geographic about like uh, Traianus or Hadrian's Rome like first century AD and there's like 10 minutes nice nice tour around ancient Rome without people with statues and so including Colosseum you see huge stadium for arena uh, for big games this was important thing that even emperors kept their power with uh, the new with things populism they can uh, help hold people you know in the uh, Attention with having these arenas, gladiators, games, even the Colosseum, they're actually naval battles. They fill it like a pool with water and there were ships fighting, you know. Uh, they call it Pastas at Circus, Circus at Pastem, Pachem, but it's peace, but um, I forgot to, to say this word in Latin, how it's called in Latin, but Chlip uh, Ahri, Circus, it's games because it's usually in the circle, circle building arenas, Colosseum, just like in Pula, Croatia, for example, and uh, when they have bread, they are okay, and they don't mind losing their political rights and so on. Be aware of this, because very often in uh, the history of democracies or republics, you see that sometimes people in the times of crisis are willing to give, their, give up their freedoms, liberties, and hand it over to some guys. Some are cool, yeah, okay, especially your great-grandparents, maybe they adore socialism and so on. But the point is that many people didn't have freedom and it's upon you if you pick this up or not. Of course, we are fighting for this. Ah, God, Mitra, uh, this is one of the other things, not Apollon uh, or Helios. But it's actually God Mitra, and this will be interesting when I mention this. Okay, with including spas and uh, forums, like squares and uh, halls, and it was a really incredible town that no other in ancient times could challenge it, maybe in China. And even Chinese, actually, for Chinese, Rome was 
like visible, like they spotted it. Oh, yeah, there are some Romans there, so let's make trade with them. Silk Road, but that was the only period of Europe in which Chinese really, like, did any attention, paid any attention uh, to them. Okay, guys, so let it be. Uh, let's move on quickly, because we have a lot of stuff to, to pass. Uh, other thing is that what I want to show you, wanted to show you is... Uh, they actually um, start to build up the rule. One is to conquer the, the new province, new territory. The other is to colonize it and use it as a part of the empire. And that was this uh, thing what we call Pax Romana, the peace of Romans or the Roman peace. Uh, generally, it is called like the period of long-term peace when it's really fine. You can go uh, and travel from Britain to, to Armenia, from uh, Morocco, somewhere to Egypt. And uh, there is actually stable uh, law, stable law and protection, and it's okay. Of course, for locals like these Versingetorics and so on, for Judeans at those times, for Jews, uh, there were many uprisings, many wars around. But once when you were subjected, you accepted their rule, you had to accept, of course, that these provinces were uh, being filled with this Roman cities, and there were many veterans being settled in here, and many people were enslaved. So. Generally, you know, after a couple of generations, Romans just mixed up with local population. That was a very big example in uh, Spain, in Portugal, in Lusitania, in, uh, in uh, Hispania Taraconensis, in Dacia. Nations were really big and warmongering nation that had to fight and Romans really did a lot to defeat them. And after this Trajan, Trajanus 117 AD, Dacia, Odisha was already conquered. And because they were resist resilient, resistant, so Romans forced them, you know, to, to to be Romanized, to accept Latin culture, Latin language, Latin customs, and if they didn't fight, so they were enslaved, taken to uh, to arenas with gladiators and to quarries and mines, and their women were given to the veterans of Roman army. With the, in this way, within three, four generations, almost whole territory of let's say Dacia was Romanized, and in in such a um, large scale that even after the fall of Roman Empire, this Pydacia was soon attacked by Germanic tribes, by Huns, and then mostly by Slavic people who really besieged it, and even arrival of Hungarians, Magyars in early Middle Ages who settled in here, Germans from uh, in Middle Ages, in cities in the middle apart. Still they kept them, that these Valachians and Moldovans and people in Transylvania were still speaking form of Latin. And when they start to unify in the 19th century, Valachia and uh, Moldova, they created country called, that they invented brand new name for this, called Romania. Romans, land of people speaking Roman, that these Dacians combine, mix with many other, including Turks and so on. They actually, even today, they speak like 20 million people speak a form of Latin, like in the sea of Slavic people or Hungarians and so on. So this is something what we call uh, that it's Romanization. And this happened that Celtic land, uh, nations in here, Celtic people in Gallia, in Switzerland, uh, in Oricum and uh, Pannonia, in Hispania, and in Britannia, they start to speak uh, various forms of Latin. Uh, actually, later on, invasions that we mentioned, especially these uh, great migrations of Germanic nations caused, that uh, some of them, uh, of course, got Germanized, like uh, Netherlands or uh, England. But uh, France, for example, they actually swallow Burgundians, Franks, uh, who arrived there, and they still are speaking this Romance language. The same thing happened in here when Visigoths and Vandals settled in Hispania, but uh, Spain is like so similar to Italian. I told you this example about Asians. If you would be wondering why there are not, no Roman-speaking peoples in eastern part of Roman Empire, the reason was that this was mostly Greek cultural uh, territory, and Greek language was much more dominant. The other thing is that also in Byzantine Empire, uh, they still kept on using 
uh, Greek language even in Middle Ages, and gradually as the Byzantine Empire was destroyed mostly by Ottoman Turks, so those nations were being actually annihilated. Today from Armenia, which is, I don't know, 3-4 million people pop, uh, people's country, once used to be even a huge and big and very important province of Roman Empire and even independent kingdom for many years. Ask the system of a down band, which is in here. So look at this. These are Roman colonies and uh, uh, mid uh, cities of uh, of or castrums of this uh, uh, Roman territory. So you can see that uh, Romans were really settling in here and uh, spreaded their culture. So the re uh, the result is in here that we can talk about Roman speaking people uh, apart from huge dominant Italy, France, Spain, and Portugal, partially Belgium, for example, and Switzerland. Uh, we have also Romania and Moldavia still speaking this Latin form. So really interesting, I would say. You know this picture from uh, your assignment, so I'm really like, uh, probably you will help each other with this case, but be sure you uh, copy, the, you, you take over the correct information, because if you do not, uh, you can become like this confusing stories from the last days, you know, last weeks, it's not very nice. So check out your information, check out your sources, especially. From the period of Principate, uh, I decided to give a couple of names like Tiberius, Titus, Claudius, uh, because these were like important guys from the first century uh, uh, AD. Among them, when I uh, was talking about that, uh, mentioned guys who are well or infamous, well known for to be cruel or mad. So, of course, that would be Nero and Caligula. The reason is that these two guys were actually hunting for Christians as a brand new religion at those times. But contrary to Claudius, Titus and even Tiberius, who were also hunting for uh, Christians uh, too. Actually, Jesus, if he was a real personality, he was born in the times of Octavius Augustus and he was crucified in the times of Tiberius. And contrary to them, they were even a bit mad uh, that uh, Nero, he wanted to write a poem about burning uh, burning Troy and escape of Aeneas from burning Troy. So he ordered his men to set big fires in Rome so he could see like huge city on fire and screaming, got inspiration and muse to help him with uh, having like creating, writing the poetry about this. And Caligula was probably the most infamous that he married his own sister. He proclaimed a horse, his pyramid horse, a senator, but he really adored like blood games and so on. But even the others, the other emperors were hunting for Christians, following them because they were at the time too radical and actually breaking kind of tolerance, religious tolerance in here. But later on, who's going to write about them? So I mentioned maybe Suetonius, the guy who wrote the lifetimes of uh, lives of 12 Roman emperors. But later on, uh, Christian, medieval, and even later up to Victorian era, Anybody, any emperor who um, actually persecuted Christians was then a bad guy, despite Romans loved them and so on. The thing is, the point, that's why Hadrian or Hadrian, so uh, they were a bit different, like more moderate, I would say, but they expanded the most in the, their times. From uh, the other guys, not Marxu or Marchu in Hungarian, but Marcus Aurelius. Marcus Aurelius, you know, this golden mark, golden Marcus is uh, famous for our territory because this philosopher on the throne from the second half of the second century AD as the emperor was one of the last great emperors he defeated um, Quadi and Marcomani tribes here above the Danube there are many stories connected also with the territory of Slovakia but as a stoic philosophy representative he also uh, was kind of a good good rule, ideal rule, contrary to San Commodus, and then there was decline. Of course, there are, there are many, many emperors. When you open uh, the, the timeline, it was really a big, big difference. Uh, my question also in your assignment is about some brand new religions. Uh, they were, when I uh, start out with this uh, uh, assignment, I, I had to really 
argue, <laughs> had to fight, uh, I mean, word fight with some of my students because some of them didn't think that Christianity was the one, of course, we all agree that it's the one, but the other one, Zoroastrianism or some other sects. But the point is that in this first and second century AD, in Roman Empire, much more popular than Christianity and even more popular than the Ro Roman religion, cults of Jupiter and Juno, and actually many, let's say, Celtic gods or Iranian gods, one of them, one of these Iranian brand new gods, monotheistic god, became really popular, and that was god called Mitra. And uh, whole cities were just like his... Uh, so again, you cannot see, but uh, you know, maybe the sign of a fish in Ichois, which is in Greek means the fish, and uh, yeah, that that was <clears throat> sorry one of the occupation of uh, the apostles. So fish became like hidden secret symbol of Christians. Uh, the same is uh, hoi or ihoi, which is uh, letters uh, Jesus Christos in Greece with I and X. So this is like famous. And again, picture you cannot see because of my face. This is God Mitra. And only to show it to you, I will, sorry, I will uh, move it a bit for you. If I can find it. No, 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 I'm just like two pages back. Sorry for that. I had to go back. I know that is not very good <laughs> uh, thing about me, but yeah, okay, let's move this guy here. Okay, so we can see it. And this is the thing that this young god, young god uh, with... Uh, with aureola around his head, look like Helios or something like that, but sometimes long hair like Jesus, you know. And the point is that early Christians, that they adopted many of popular myths of various gods and goddesses of uh, ancient Roman religions from Egypt, uh, ancient Greece, uh, from Mithraism, and uh, even some Celtic, even some Celtic uh, religions, they combine it together. And stories uh, about storylines about Jesus, you know, the four evangelians, they are sometimes even very contradictory. And especially miracles and maybe some things that are not historical facts, but mention one of the apostles where actually combination of the myths of Mitra, of uh, birth of uh, Aset in uh, Egypt, or uh, myths about Heracles himself. So that was really interesting, and you should really remember that many things that we know we have sometimes had much longer history, and roots are um, roots can be really very deep and wide, so it's not like about pure blood, you know. Never, you're never only like pure magician like Harry Potter, but even mock blood. Okay, guys, uh, let's move on. Gradually, since the third century, uh, again, Principate Empire of Rome uh, came to crisis, just like we mentioned. There are a couple of them, but you can, of course, add some more of these. Uh, uh, ideas to your assignment, but generally there were uh, pensions for veterans. You know that veterans were given pension in form of a land and some slaves and they could like build their farms and thus colonize and Romanize these provinces. The problem was, I should go back to with the map, that uh, Roman Empire in the times of Trajan and Hadrian were the, the beauties, so they actually span their geographical limits. Let's check it out. Here, Atlantic Ocean. Here they had to build two walls, the Hadrian's Wall and Antonine's Wall, because Picts and Hibernians, these Gauls, Celts, were just plundering these lands. And Romans really didn't want to settle in Scotland. You know, there it's like raining too much, there is no really fertile soil, and a lot of these, these flies that bite you, so it's not very nice. The place that could be good to settle down was over, um, across the River Rhine, but the problem was that they were not able to break the power of Germanic tribes, generally called Teutonians. This is a Latin word for Germans, and actually it comes from their own uh, name for them, Deut, Deut, or Deutsch, Deutschland, it means people in Germanic lands. They were defeated in uh, this... Um, uh, Teutoburg uh, Forest, and there is even TV series about it, I haven't watched it yet. But then you have the Danube River, and again, they, for example, tried to build some settlements in, let's say, Slovakia, Moravia, but the power of Germans were not so big. The other thing was, at the same time, more and more Germanic tribes were arriving because Huns, nomadic Asian tribe, uh, entered, invaded Europe, and pushed all these Germans, so they actually broke the Limes Romanus fortification, sometimes they were actually uh, allowed to come freely to Roman Empire, settle down and help in order to fight against other barbarians. And in this way, they couldn't break these uh, lands. 
Okay, maybe there was position to get here, but still they didn't have uh, enough power for that. Black Sea, Caucasian Mountains, here there are deserts, you cannot see it, but I will show it in my way. Uh, there was a strong Persian Empire, too, too difficult to break, Rom for, for Romans to break uh, Persian power. Then there were Arabic deserts, so I'm impossible to settle down, and Sahara Desert. So the, the places they could actually expand here in Eastern Europe or in Central Europe, were actually unbreakable for them. So that's why another reason for them, uh, for the crisis, was that uh, veterans were not paid off. They didn't want to serve in the legions, and that's why armies, at least to protect empire against invasions of barbarians, were, uh, had to be open for even non-citizens of Rome. And actually whole uh, squads of tribes, of Germanic tribes, let's say even Huns and so on. The other problem was that still there were no telephones and cars and airplanes despite a ex exquisite road uh, network, so it was ineffect ineffective to uh, rule in this huge empire. So that's why they start to divide uh, empire, not empire, but empire, and Sometimes it was divided in two parts, in four parts, that is called this period of Tetrarchy, Tetrarchia, that you got two, four archons, four emperors, and finally for the last time in only two pieces, in two parts. That happened in 395, and that was the thing. The other thing was that there were many wars and invasion, and as you see, force accepting of barbarians among Romans. Actually, I didn't explain this uh, meaning, what does it mean, uh, Roman barbarian at all? So, barbar, uh, it's like blah blah. Uh, when somebody, when you can't understand somebody, you uh, start to mock his language and you think that he's stupid because he cannot speak your language. And if you think that your language, Latin, Greek, is ultimate, exquisite, the best civilized, the only civilized language, so any other language is just primitive. So, barbarians as primitive, uneducated, uncultural people are anybody who are not Romans and who are not Greeks, who are not of antique states. So in this way, uh, you know, Roman uh, armies had to be open for also non-Romanized population, and it was changing a lot. Together with Christianity, that was calling for different uh, type of rule, contrary to these Roman emperors, and so on. Finally, uh, at the end of this period, 284, uh, the Emperor Diocletian abolished republican institutions, as I already mentioned, with Senate and so on, and it started to be called Dominus, which means Lord. Dominus et Deus, Lord and the God. And that he had like all these things together, so we don't need to call it Principate anymore, that the Emperors at least pretended that they serve for the people, but now the Emperors serve for themselves. That's why we talk about the period of dominate in here. So what happened? Uh, in this period of dominate, uh, emperors had to uh, struggle with many problems of uh, the empire. Uh, the empire was being divided, uh, Christianity was uh, spreading very quickly, very fast, and uh, its Roman Empire was being attacked by many, many nations, and in the end, eventually, it fell down. So generally, what you need to know from the period of so-called dominate by the end of the Western Roman Empire, in 467 AD, maybe is the perhaps is the rule of Constantine the Great, Constantine Velki. Uh, already at this time, they had been preparing for building brand new capital city because Rome was uh, completely like out dated, uh, old-fashioned place uh, with a lot of uh, logistic, uh, hygiene, uh, organizational problems. And even to get to sea, it was not next to the sea. So that's why Constantine picked up the a village, fisherman's village called Byzantium, uh, in the Bosporus, Cipreilu Bospor, between the Black Sea and the Marmar Sea, which leads to the Aegean Sea. And he decided to procure, to build brand new town. Again, my face is ruining all the pictures. So I will show you, I will show you, I will move these pictures like here. Okay, that would be okay for, so for now. Uh, so he uh, ordered to build and project a town with huge streets, big streets, with stadiums, hippodromes, with uh, palaces and beautiful gardens and fortification, huge 
so big, so huge that uh, would defend against anybody. What is a big surprise for many people was that this fortification lasted for more than 1000 years and even they survived, uh, almost survived the creation of modern artillery, uh, only building huge cannons, uh, probably like five meters long cannons, were able to break down these walls. They were so thick, so great. Uh, actually, only two armies broke these walls. They were crusades in 1204, in the year 1204, during the fourth crusade, Štvrta križová výprava. It was just a surprise for them. And uh, finally, Ottoman Turks. So this town started to be called, called in Greek, uh, Constantinopolis, in English, Constantinople, and became new capital city of Roman Empire. Uh, Still, it was not the last one. Uh, today, you can see it as uh, Istanbul in Turkey. The other thing that uh, he did is uh, down in the picture. So again, I need to move it to this place because we already golden horned is how they call it. Sorry. Uh, Constantine also uh, he had to call fight with uh, the opponents with the other rival emperors and keep his power and there were many legends what happened in his armies the truth things that we know are that in uh, Roman armies there were already a lot of Romans who were either Mithraists or Christians and because Christians were being for like oppressed and persecuted it was still like sect you know and some crazy people you know but uh, there are so many followers that uh, his army consisted of many of them so he decided to uh, legalize christianity and make it one of many religions allowed uh, allowed so legal uh, legal in the legal, legal, it means uh, it's derived from Latin what the leg is, lex, which means law, so judicially correct, uh, allowed. Uh, so legal uh, religions, that was Christianity. Later on, there were many legends that appeared like uh, that he had uh, the dream that in the sky angels brought him the sign of a cross, but not a cross as you can see in this painting from Baroque period, but usually this letter X and Y, this is Ichio, and uh, they uh, told him that you shall win in this sign. And the next morning he allowed his Christian soldiers to wear these like Christian sign symbols on the shields and they won uh, the battle. So as a reward, so he allowed them to praise uh, their God, they one God, Jewish God, and not to be followed, you know, and the Messiah that was Jesus of Nazareth or Jesus Christ, which is from Greek and means Christos. As you can see that into Latin, there are many Greek words coming and the the thing is, the point is, because this capital town moved from Rome to Constantinople, so it started to be more Hellenistic, more Greek in this way. Okay, what is the Edict of Milan? Edict of Milan is simply legalization of Christianity in Roman Empire. And in 313 AD, since this time, Christians were not being followed. By that time, many of the Christian uh, representatives were being uh, tortured, being killed, and all these guys were later proclaimed saints for Christians because they were suffering and died, uh, rather than they should give, they would give up their faith. And many of them that you know, actually all of them were living in these times, as you have in here. Okay, for Romans it didn't matter because even Mithraism was much more important than Christianity, but already in 4th century things dramatically changed. Later on, if you watch movie, for example, Agora, uh, with, I believe, Rachel Weisz, uh, so you'll see that's happening in times of Roman Empire in Alexandria, in this Ptolemaic Hellenistic Alexandria of late dominated Roman Empire, uh, and how Christianity is on the rise. And as many religions, uh, they experience the periods of like fanatism and chauvinism, and people who disagree with you are just pagan or heathens or... Uh, like uh, heretics and uh, being followed and it comes finally to the point when the library of Alexandria was being burnt which we are all set for that later on Christianity was actually uh, proclaimed the only religion much later uh, after um, the edict of Milan Milanski edict near Milano or Milanski edict and it happened in 375 AD and uh, other religions were being persecuted Olympic games were uh, uh, being abolished because they were like pagan celebration so this is really interesting that Western Roman Empire actually uh, actually whole at the time still whole Roman Empire turned to Christianity still it was not the first Christian country in the world before them there had been one country this is the really first state of Christianity and that was what I already mentioned Armenia they already uh, accepted Christianity in 305 I believe more or less 
And the second country after Armenia was Ethiopia. So kingdom, African kingdom, the southern of Sudan, uh, they accepted Christianity even before Romans. You know? So that was really interesting how it was spreading. The other thing is in here are these what we call great migrations. We call it... Um, uh, and these are actually this invasion of barbarians because we know that all of them were real barbaric but it looked like this mostly there were germanic tribes uh, who were moved by huns you will see some maps even later on and you've seen some of them the point is that they start to be uh, entered and roman empire attacked or visited and settled by many various germanic tribes i mentioned many of them actually for this history of rome there are mostly gods important gods were divided in two parts in eastern gods uh, that were called ostrogoths and western gods that were called visigoths and these guys were actually first guys who uh, actually pl attacked and plundered Rome and became like first invasion of Germanic tribes in 410 AD. The other guys who followed them some decades later was another Germanic tribe that uh, spent many years in Poland, then uh, probably many years in Slovakia. And there is very nice di uh, discovery in Matejovce near Poprad when there is the only discovered Germanic uh, tomb of a chieftain from this period. And it seems to be there is a hypothesis, maybe vandals, we don't know actually still, or I don't know at least. So just read the history web and many others, uh, many other sites, archaeological sites, uh, serious ones. And uh, the guy who was there... Maybe Germanic, we don't know, but he had like plenty multicultural, multi, I mean, like cultural and archaeological way, uh, things from all over the Europe, how they were traveling. Vandals, after uh, sacking Rome, Virabovani uh, Rima, they actually went to Gallia, to France, then they spent some time in Spain, then they crossed the sea, went down to Africa, and ended up finding their Vandal kingdom in Tunisia, in Carthage. In Carthage, they had capital of Vandals, and of course, within the decade, they just got assimilated with the locals so you see it from Poland and across all like Europe so this is the biggest Euro trip of vandals still uh, you will see why we call some people vandals with small V not with capital V uh, symbolical for you that you may also remember is the Battle of Catalonian Plains between Catalanskich Poliach, where uh, finally they clashed Romans and Germans clashed with Huns, who had also many Germanic allies, led by Attila the Hun or Attila as we know it. Many Hungarians believe still like uh, fake stories that now, since the Middle Ages that the Huns were everywhere, actually any nomadic nation since that time was called by, uh, Huns by European chronicle writers and scholars, including Avars, including Magyars, just like these are Hungarians, so an incorrect name for them. Uh, later on, even Mongolians were called Huns, even Turks were called Huns at the beginning. So as you can see, that was really very different, very various, but the point was that Huns pushed Germans who pushed uh, all these great migrations. What else? Uh, because of this uh, sacking Rome, uh, really town was in very bad state, so even Western Roman Empire uh, had to change its capital town, which was moved to Ravenna. Uh, simple, simply the division of the empire that I actually jumped over happened in 395, and there was def definite dis dissolution of the empire in Western Roman Empire and Eastern Roman Empire, which was typical that Western Roman Empire still was speaking Latin because it was Latin Romanized area, and Eastern part is uh, was this Greek, and it uh, Greek language was also uh, dominant for them. I just check out the time, pozriem si čas. Dobre, 17 minut, že mali by sme to úplne v pohodičke pekne zvládnuť. So, since the time, since the time, again, okay, thanks. Uh, since the time we have uh, two empires, East and West, which is, which is interesting, because here in uh, this Western Empire, as you will see in the end of the lesson, Many countries would claim and uh, that there are the the heritage of Romans, but holy because they would be like Christians already. And East Roman Empire just didn't mind; they just went on without any interruption. So even Byzantine Empire of Middle Ages didn't start with 467. It started with invasion of Greek of Romans uh, to Hellenistic kingdoms in like second century BC. You know, so that was. Uh, bit different and Romans does survive for like 
many, many years. Even Byzantines didn't call themselves Byzantines, they called themselves Romanoi, which means Romans in Greek language, Rimania. Just like Romanians uh, in here. Okay, what else if we have? Okay, this is uh, some pictures from uh, uh, books I had. This is actually some of the Hunic uh, writers. This is another like some some artist uh, idea image how Germanic tribes were migrating, like whole tribes in here. And this is also there is like short story how they uh, how vandals. Uh, were in here. These are actually uh, not great invasions, but all the roads and main directions of uh, these, all these uh, tribes. As you can see, Goths, Ostrogoths, and Visigoths moving from uh, the homeland of Germanic tribes in northern Germany and southern Scandinavia, uh, walking along like all Eastern Europe and to Italy and France and Spain and as Vandals you see even in here. Uh, Pigs and Scots is only for the British Isles, important just like uh, Anglo-Saxons and Jews, we learn about them. Franks would be very important, Germanic tribe, because they would be dominant for a couple of centuries in uh, Gallia, in these promises of Gallia, and uh, they would be the first uh, Western European nation or tribe that uh, confessed to Christian faith. And uh, thus they established a famous uh, Frankish empire that we will soon, le soon learn about that. And from Francia, as they were called, there would be two important countries created, France and Germany. And of course, many others around in here. Alemanni, Alemanni in here. And you know, in, if you speak French, you know that Germany in French is called Alemanni and is derived from Alemannians. Swabi from various lands in here. Also, they spent some time in here. As you see, Ostrogoths, we will mention them again, created a whole kingdom in from Pannonia even to Slovakia, including Rome. Visigoths settled in Spain. But all these lands, all these, both of these tribes, including Franks and Burgundians, uh, got assimilated in the sea of Romanized population. So if you check out the genetics of, let's say, Spanish or French or Italian speaking peoples, that would be very Roman. Some partially would be Celtic. Some may be ancient, Punic, Greek, or whatever, even older. And even there should be some small part of Germanic blood because they settled there. Here in Slovakia, many of them were, in, I mentioned Ostrogoths, uh, Vandals, for example, they were Heruls and so on. Lombards or Longobards stay in here. Later on, they moved to northern Italy since the time it's called Lombardia. Burgundians, they survived for many years, it is Germanic speaking, until late Middle Ages, so that was really interesting. And Huns, in here, and actually as any and every nomadic nation that succeeded in settling in Central Europe, they found their best way in Hungarian plains or Great Danubian Basin in here. So that's why Hungarians, despite there is no real historical genetical connection, so they still claim kind of like history of theirs, uh, many of them believe that they came from the same period, same territories, which is not true. They Huns are from more of east. Uh, Magyars were, of course, they had been there somewhere in uh, South Uralic mountains, close to Turkic uh, languages. But uh, many of people in Hungarian or in Magyar language are called Attila and so on and claim it, which is not true. Many even historians 19th century looking for mythical golden treasure because when Attila died, uh, some historians described that there was a huge like uh, ceremony and uh, his funeral was done like in a very big secret and everybody who was there, he was killed. So not to be fine. And some people are looking for this Attila's grave in, even in Turiets because they couldn't find it in like along Tisa River, which we supposed to be there. Okay, let's move on, guys, because it's not the end of the lesson. Uh, you cannot see poor Roman women, families in another another's artist image of uh, vandals sacking Rome. And this is interesting because... Uh, when you don't understand the meaning of uh, of Corinthian uh, order of beauty, if, of beauty is not only gold and shiny things and women, but even reliefs and paintings and culture and art that is there. 
So you destroyed it and you have no idea how valuable for many people it is, how much knowledge you can gain and bring it to your nation. You can improve the life of your nation, of your people. And vandals or other German tribes didn't know it, so they're destroying it. Of course, many of them, they did know. But this has generally happened that uh, they these vandals were sacking Rome for two weeks and they destroyed everything, even that was valuable for them. So when you, for example, destroy, break a window or you destroy some historical monument, when you spray it with wall or spray the walls with this of historical monument, you are a vandal with small v because it uh, became synonymous for a person that is so stupid, so uneducated, that has no idea about the real meaning and value of the things that he or she is destroying. So, poor vandals, Ravenna in here, mostly medieval town, but as you can see, this already like this style of late Roman period Christian things but mosaics and cupolas are typical rotundas typical for late Roman art and architecture which is really interesting. You aren't a true goth until you sect Rome. You may remember this gothic lifestyle and subgenre and culture. I mean the bands like Cure or I don't know some girls bands rock music but this ammo. <laughs> so you're not a true god until you say wrong. God, what she meant, yeah, and what do you, we wish to mean, and like real gods in here. This is actually from the books of uh, Publishing House Osprey from the series Man at Arms and uh, really like not very thick books but really in detail sometimes with mistakes but still the best uh, possibly for like special units from ver various countries from various historical periods there are hundreds about them even about medieval Hungarian armies is one special book okay Lo dog lore gods 4 and 10 AD and gods today I <laughs> love that since I just said Rome another funny stuff I prefer the real god the real god and okay this is the thing that in Middle Ages, uh, there were two architectural styles, Romanesque, that seemed to be like a f evolution of Roman styles of these rotundas and cupolas, which they evolved in uh, vaults, we'll learn about this. And later on, in uh, High Middle Ages, uh, from France and Italy, they start to develop this Gothic style, Gothicky slow. And uh, nobody knows why I call it like Goth, Gothic, because it got nothing with Goths from these like uh, ancient nations that migrated. Okay, read it to me again, Daddy. I just love happy endings, the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Yeah, these are not Vikings. Even horns are like uh, fake things and teddy bear with eggs in his head. I believe you have fun right now. Okay, guys, we're coming to the end slowly. Uh, this picture, for obviously, from the books, from history books from 19th century, and depicts the picture from Ravenna about the end of West Roman Empire and of its fall. In, uh, in 476 there was the last Western Roman Emperor with a really symbolical name, Romulus, like the father of Rome, Augustus, uh, which is the nickname of the greatest emperor. The thing is that very often he's called Augustulus, which means like little Augustus, Augustic, hey? Augustus, Susik, hey? something like that. And he possessed this great two names, but he was actually a young boy. And when uh, Ostrogothic chieftain Odoacar, or Odoacir in English, but I like this Odoacar because this is Germanic name, uh, entered with his armies, he entered these places with his armies. So he just like, hey boy, like hand me over the power. It's no point, you rule like in Ravenna. Rome is in ruins, nobody like listening, your, your, your people are, are gone, you know. So these sad days for this boy made uh, very nice, which I really enjoyed. And if you're able to see the Slovak insanation, as we call it, Slovenska insanacija, and this short part of it. <laughs> Germáni pochodujú na Rím. Oh, kedy odchádzalo do Alexandrie? Zajtra o 9. Na čo tak chceš ísť? Požiadať Abyssinského císara o azyl. Abyssinia Etiópia. Germáni pochodujú na Rím. Ty stále raňajkuješ. To je výsada politikov. Odoaker má k dispozícii 100 tisícovú armádu dobre vyzbrojených Germánov. Čím väčší vojvodca, tým menej vojakov potrebuje. 
No, ak by ste si pozreli Romus Veľký, divadelnú hru, toto je v pozadí inscenácie, možno to aj je vieš, presne od koho. Myslím, že to bol nemecký dramatik, už neviem, ktorý, ktorý to napísal, ale parádnu scénu on spravil teda z toho Romula Augustula dospelého chlapa, pravda je také, že to bol vlastne malý chlapec. So, that was the real story that he was a young boy, 12 year old emperor and he just like didn't want to be the puppet and uh, of his father and he really gave power to Odyssey. In this incarnation this is really nice because Peter Mikulik, uh, big guy with big beard, uh, red hair, uh, so he finally came and they had beautiful all night talk like how terrible vibes they had and everybody expects them to be better than their fathers and they want to live their own life and Romulus Augustus for example he had the biggest fun with his flock of chicken and hens that he gave them names of great Roman emperors and feed them and you know, uh, <laughs> Caesar and uh, Trianus and whatever and really they wanted to live their life in different way what the big history and all the people expected them from so this is really interesting so if you have chance to watch it this is another from another picture from this Osprey publishing man at arms series books how Odoacir is uh, have, like accepting sort of uh, Romulus Augustus. As you can see even the depiction of uh, weaponry, it doesn't look very much like ancient times and these antique robes and armors and it looks much more like early Middle Ages, which I would agree that we are coming to the scene here. And as I showed you this kingdom of Ostrogoths from almost Slovakia coming even to Italy, but as I said within like a couple of centuries, uh, Longobards would destroy the northern territories and so on. Generally, this Gen Germanic tribes got dissoluted, assimilated, and this is how Italians were created, that still language w was really dominant in here. Here in Slovakia, we had Heralds and Lombards and nomadic Yaziks in here, and Huns already not in here. But what is in here? Venedi, which is uh, one of early names for Slavic peoples in here. Okay, uh, I had to guess how much time I have right now and it's only four minutes and this will be really quick guys So uh, but you were happy that you can stop it pause it watch it again So what are the who were the successors and descendants of Rome? Definitely Byzantine Empire because that was this eastern part and they didn't even mind that uh, Western Roman Empire was occupied by Ostrogoths, they just lived their life with Justinian the Great and so on. When Byzantine Empire uh, was destroyed, or after Byzantine uh, Empire was destroyed in 1453, uh, their religion, Eastern uh, Orthodox Church, was accepted by uh, Grand Duchy of Moscow or Moscovite Grand Duchy from which Great Russian Char uh, Tsardom, Russian Tsardom was created, and that's why Moscow sometimes is called the Third Realm, not only in political but in religious way. Of course, in the West, Francia, and later on, Holy Roman Empire, which is actually German medieval state, uh, claimed to be the heir of Romans. Habsburgs definitely, because they overruled Roman Empire until 1805, until Napoleon Bonaparte. Of course, in Italy itself, Pope took over the hand of this Pontifex Maximus, so Holy Sea, Sveta Stolica and Vatican, and generally Roman Catholic Church, not as a state, but as a religious organization. Medieval Italian city-states, Venice, Benatki, Genoa, Jano, Florence, many of them uh, took not only uh, Roman law uh, as municipal law, but even kind of republican system, freedom, equality for population, and many things, renaissance, humanism from these. Political institutions were actually adopted from combination of these, but they were inspired by Republican government of Venice, Genoa, and they were introduced, let's say, in uh, Enlightenment. And from Enlightenment, of these ideas, new states were being created, like United States of America. They claim it like Roman heritage, French Republic, French Empire of 19th century and many others. Empires, Napoleon, he really adored and he actually copied the way of to the power of God Julius Caesar. He actually repeated the names, Republic and Empire again, many others too. But even Italian states in the 19th century and Benito Mussolini's fascism, Fastes was the symbol that lictors were carrying and this is how they start to call themselves. But even art of Renaissance and Classicism. So when you go up through all of these who were claiming the heritage of them, even Ottomans, somebody would say Finland with this democracy and Republican government. So 
this is something like really what people made fun even in Quora, if you know this states this is you cannot see it. holy roman empire rush ottoman turks claim to be successor rome but no one cares but this is what you can see with cupola with greek styles with architecture just like in rome or in athens this is capital this is the the place of american government and the congress being stormed by trump's uh followers supporters that's why it is dangerous it was not only fun like resistance no it was attack on democracy and basic principles of roman republic the same this is the supreme court of usa and we still use latin alphabet latin letters and this is picture from like adolf hitler moving as a puppet benito Mussolini fascist fascist uh, troops and here it is written you cannot see it but i will read it for you morituri te salutant russia libya e morte so you shall die you know in the end so these are things in here and legacy of rome generally are from many things that you probably had no problem to search for but i would point at these definitely law because from uh duo decim tabularum uh, legis so the tables or the law of the 12 tables later on byzantines created codex juris civilis codex občianskeho prava medieval law was derived from this byzantine uh, law written in latin and later on napoleon bonaparte introduced code civil so civilian code, Občianski zákon in 19th century, and we use this system until today. Architecture, Etruscan and Roman round walls, aqueducts, roads, military camps and towns called Castrum, Manchester, it's Man Castrum, Castrum on the, uh, on the river Man. Every Chester in England was Roman town once. Christianity, we don't need to discuss about it. Latin language used in sciences, in biology, in history, that's why I told you about Suetonius, but there were many other. Plutarcho, Atacitus, great historians who were followers of Herodotus and many others. Latin script was later uh, changed in a sim symbolic way in small, like majuscula, but later in minuscula, small letters. We use it even today. Alphabet words uh, distribution in here. Let's check it out because probably that would be what all countries of the world use Latin script. And this is, these guys are where Romans get because this is the letters of Romans from Australia, New Zealand to Alaska, everywhere. And tell me that Romans wouldn't be important, guys. Art of Rhetoric, Cicero, you have to pick up some of the great ideas uh, of sentence or quotes of this famous uh, uh, rhetoric, which is Rhetor, Rosprat, so many of them are in here, so just pick it up and don't forget that Cicero was a big, huge critic of Gaius Julius Caesar and his rise to the power. Okay, I'm one minute over, but it doesn't matter because when we talk about Roman military, so we have many of the styles of legions, war machines, troops, organization. Still, we love and everybody was using spas and municipal, municipal baths, so this is really great at things. Mal by som vám pustiť kúsok z Monty Pythonovho filmu, ak nezabudem, na budúce vám ho pustím. But generally, Republican and Imperial form of government. Many things in here, big Latin, I love this story, we don't have time to analyze it, but uh, just uh, click it, click it, pause it, and try to analyze, me, analyze it. If you remember, if somebody can write me, the first guy who can write me translation of all these pics quotes from Latin in English and in Slovak, both, so you'll be given extra bonus one. Those at Makina. Okay, and what is so gracias tum per audienci. So thanks for listening. Fonteze Fontibudi, so literature and my sources, Libri Historia, you understand, history books, Pagine Internet, so pages of the internet, Auctor Edretor, that's me, because I was speaking and I was talking to you, so you're listening to me, Audicio. Aj magister, my nom Breznošťák from Gymnasium Andreas Kmetinianum, Šebný zbána fal Argenti Fodina Slovácia, and we have years in here too, and what else do you need to know, what do you need to, Roman numbers and everything. Okay guys, so that's all from me, so thank, thanks for attention, and that's all, so next time we are moving to Middle Ages, so bye bye, have a nice day, stay negative in test and positive in mind, bye bye.